you have government decides to put a tax on pizza for some reason. All pizza, one dollar per slice you have to pay in taxes. Doesn't matter what the cost of the pizza is. Could be Little Caesars, super cheap, shitty pizza. Could be a really nice pizza from whatever the pizza shop in town is. Used to be MVP owned. What do you think people are going to buy more of? The really good pizza or the cheap, shitty pizza? What do you think demand is going to change to? Cheap pizza. The cheap pizza? Yeah. I think it depends on like the area you're around. If you have an expensive pizza place in a lower market, I don't think it would do very well. OK. But that's interesting, breaking up by market. Yeah. I like that thought. So a lot of time our instant reaction is, oh, we think the cheaper one is going to get more demand because they're both going up by the same amount. But that ignores opportunity cost. So Alchin and Allen were two economists. Um, they both recently passed away. Um, but they were prolific. They figured this out in like the 60s and kept writing, like doing, I don't know, all these different papers and stuff for years and years after that. They said that if you increase the fixed cost for, you know, the price of two goods of different quality and different price by one fixed amount, consumption is actually going to shift to the higher cost good, the higher quality good. So we have cigarettes here as an example. That's what they first looked at. California passed a tax on cigarettes, one dollar per pack, no matter how cheap or expensive the cigarettes were. So initially, <coughs> when there's no tax, the really cheap cigarettes cost a dollar a pack, and the high quality ones cost three dollars. So the opportunity cost of buying one high quality pack of cigarettes, you have to give up three packs of low quality cigarettes. So relatively expensive to buy these you know, more expensive, higher quality cigarettes. Once they instituted a tax of $1 on all cigarettes, the cost of low quality cigarettes is now $2.22, not a $5. The high quality cigarettes run from $3 to $4. Now, if you want to buy an expensive, high-quality pack of cigarettes, you only have to give up two low-quality, cheap, shitty cigarettes. Because of this, more people ended up buying the more expensive, higher-quality cigarettes. Because now you're giving up fewer cheap cigarettes to get that. Seems very counterintuitive, but because of the idea of opportunity cost, this is what we see happen. I never heard about this until grad school, and I was pretty surprised by this. I assume people would shift to buying a cheaper good just because they're now both more expensive in absolute dollars. Um, going back to the law of demand, well, we'll just look at the downward sloping demand curve here. At the end of last class in person, you asked me a question. Do you want to say it again to the class so we can talk about this? Because I thought it was interesting. I forgot exactly what I said. I, I, I have like an idea. It was something about like if the price oh, increases uh, by a certain amount, but the inflation is higher. Yeah, I asked if, if you like had a dollar. So if something cost a dollar, but the inflation went up a dollar, but like the price only went up 50%, then it was something like that. I, I forgot exactly how I worded it. Yeah, I forget the exact wording too. <laughs> um, so basically, you said if, if there's inflation, and the price of good goes up, we won't see that you know, downward sloping demand curve the same way um, the same way it exists here. One thing is that's not taking the caterers paribus into account, the all things being equal, because we're having this change in price level. Also, with this change in price level, what we're seeing is um, if you remember Econ 101, the concept of the real price versus the nominal price. So the nominal price is the sticker price that you're actually paying. But the real price is when you adjust that for inflation over time. So you end up with the real price, um, real price staying the same when it's just inflation that's driving the increase in the price. Um, that, I mean, not something you'll be tested on, but just one situation where it looks like the law of demand might break down. There's another situation where it looks like the law of demand might break down. 
and that's these um, luxury goods, the so-called, or sometimes they're called Laban goods, where it looks like they have an upward sloping demand curve. In this situation, I'll write down. So sometimes they're called snob goods. Wow, my hand doesn't drop. Or blade, what is it, I? Laban goods. And yeah, basically, as they get more expensive, the demand seems to go up. Um, I remember an undergrad guy talking about in his marketing class about watches. They cost, I think, like two or three thousand dollars a watch. They were pretty high quality, but they were trying to sell them at like a, a decent, you know, fair price, not too much of a markup. But they weren't doing so well. So for some reason, they decided, well, let's just jack it up, jack the price up to 10k, or something ridiculous like that. People looked at the price and said, oh, this must be a luxury watch, and their sales actually increased appearing like they had an upward sloping demand curve. Anyone have an idea why this might not be a case of an upward sloping demand curve? Why it might be something else going on? A little bit more of a marketing issue than an economics issue. Just they're like, because of the high price tag, they're able to spend it as a luxury good rather than a good, basically. Basically. I don't know if I would say more of a marketing issue, but I think Everything else was right, and, or at least in my opinion. I, this is more of an opinion thing, but I really like what you're getting at, is that they're changing it from a regular good to like a luxury good. So they're changing the market. Well, maybe marketing is the right thing, because they're changing the market that they're going after. Instead of going after normal people, they're now going after people in the luxury watch market. So you're now competing against Rolexes instead of, I don't know, watches, um, Timexes. Timex, like reasonably priced watch. And now that they've gotten, they moved those watches into the luxury market, now they're going to have a downward sloping demand curve again. So they've just moved themselves into a different one. Because you think generally this downward sloping demand is going to hold if everything else is held constant. There's a storm like this, suddenly your demand for you know, ice to throw down, or not ice, uh, salt to throw down on the sidewalk is going to increase. Um, now, when it comes to what shifts market demand, I'm not going to ask you like an essay question on the exam where you have to go through, I'm like, all right, what is the five factors that influence market demand? And then you write them all out. It's important to know these, to understand how they work. Um, so I'll give you a question with a market in equilibrium. And I'll describe something that happens. You'll have to pick out which factor you think it is and generally know whether that factor is going to influence supply or demand. So you need some working knowledge with it, but I'm not going to have you like have to memorize this stuff. I don't think I said that during the, the recording lecture I gave you guys, so I wanted to make sure that this isn't pure memorization. I'm just understanding how to work with these, more or less. Where's the one, the normal, yeah, normal goods and inferior goods. You guys understand the difference between those? Good example, normal good clothing, secondhand, or um, inferior goods, secondhand clothing. As you get richer, you tend to buy less and less secondhand clothing and more new clothing. Although this jacket is secondhand, found this on the internet, so you know, sometimes you still keep buying secondhand clothing. But you probably buy less as you make more. Substitutes and complements. Substitutes are goods that are competing against each other. So you're buying one or the other. You either buy a Big Mac or a Whopper. You either get Whataburger or In-N-Out. And then complements are goods that you buy together. So the Big Mac and fries, you get those together at McDonald's usually. Okay, and we went through supply. So now we're going to put supply and demand together. You guys understand supply? The basics of that. If there wasn't anything I like left out or didn't go over, I know. Okay. I want to make sure before I go on, so you guys aren't missing like you know the building blocks for this stuff. So what we call market equilibrium 
is where the quantity demanded equals the quantity supplied. So in graphical terms, we have the price on the x-axis, excuse me, on the y-axis, and quantity on the x-axis. We have our downward sloping demand curve and our upward sloping supply curve. Remember the supply curve we thought was the marginal cost curve for a firm. So the cost of producing that next unit over time is going to increase more and more because the resources you're using to produce these goods have to be bid away from alternate uses. So that's going to necessarily increase the price that firms are going to need to be willing to bring that good to the market. At this point where they cross, right there is equilibrium. So our equilibrium price, which we usually use the little asterisk next to it to signify that it's equilibrium. And right here, the equilibrium quantity. So markets with many buyers and many sellers, so the typical markets that we're going to be dealing with are what economists call perfectly competitive markets. Um, we'll go into perfect competition later on, but the basic idea is that there's a lot of sellers going on, so there's robust competition between them. So one firm isn't able to charge a super high price and keep a lot of consumers buying from them because those consumers can just go elsewhere. Same idea, they can compete on quality, so if they have a um, one firm offering super low quality good compared to the other firms they're competing against, consumers can just go to the competition. And likewise, you have a lot of buyers competing against each other, so a buyer can't just decide to pay a super low price. Like, um, well, like the COVID vaccine, Canada is not getting their vac or many doses of the vaccine delivered until like April or May because they wanted to pay as low of a price as possible. So they ended up towards the back of the line. They use that pricing power in order to pay a lower price, but they're also paying for it. If, you had, if everyone was buying you know, vaccines individually, that would cause its own problems. But what it would do is there wouldn't be any sort of market power among consumers to be able to, to pay lower prices, to choose to pay a lower price. In competitive markets, we have tons of buyers, tons of sellers. So we'll call this equilibrium that we'll be working with in the rest of this chapter a competitive market equilibrium. We'll see markets without competition later or with like limited competition are going to behave slightly differently, just slightly. Remember, the purpose of the market is to bring buyers and sellers together so that each party is making themselves better off through trade. Because the subjective value when two individuals engage in trade without being forced to, they do so because they think they're both going to be made better off. Now, Despite the fact that there's no central planner, that there's no one person or one small group of people in charge of the economy, what's going to be produced, how it's going to be produced, who's going to get what, what price it's going to be sold at, um, markets aren't disorderly. We have this idea that they seem to be chaotic. You watch old movies of Wall Street and all the people on the stock exchange yelling and screaming at each other, buy, buy, sell, sell, with like the tickets. Um, tend to think of that as what markets are like, especially when you see businesses constantly failing and succeeding. New entrants pushing out old ones, but it's not as disorderly as we tend to think. Markets move towards equilibrium over time. Remember, this is a process that's ongoing, where firms are producing different types and different quantities of the goods, selling them at different prices, trying to meet consumer needs better. Some consumers really appreciate very low prices. I watched an episode of South Park last night where um, Walmart moves into town and like people can't stop shopping there. So those people are really concerned about low prices. Some people want super high quality. Some people want um, energy efficient or green, whatever you want to call it. Like Jaguar is going to sell all electric vehicles starting in like 2025 or 2030. Some people care about that. There's all these different consumer needs and consumer wants. Firms are constantly trying to meet them and moving towards them. 
Now, equilibrium isn't permanent. We're going to be talking about markets like this, and then we'll be shifting the supply curve and the demand curve and moving to a new equilibrium. And that'll be the entire process. But it's constantly changing. So if you look at the price of goods over time, you'll see them change. Some of it will because, be because demand is increased, demand decreases, the supply increases or supply decreases. These are constantly going on. Um, the example of Uber, you pull up Uber on your app, obviously not around here, but in a decent sized city. You do it, um, you know, enter the, enter the address where you want to go, back out, do it again a couple times. You can see the price change in real time as the supply of drivers are changing and the demand of riders are changing. So Adam Smith called the tendency of markets to move to equilibrium the invisible hand, that basically markets are being guided, even though there's no one telling them what to do, that markets are being pushed towards equilibrium. Everyone's being encouraged. And we'll talk about how firms, if they're off selling goods at too low of a price, are encouraged to sell at a higher price. And how if they sell at too high of a price, they're forced by the market to offer them at a lower price. As if they're being forced, but instead they're just being encouraged by prices and by the profit and loss mechanism. Um, something kind of funny, there's this article on the Foundation for Economic Education about Tom Brady. Ten companies that advertised during Brady's first Super Bowl in 2002. You guys want to guess what some of those companies were? Sears. Sears was one of them. Well, there's a few there. So yeah, Yahoo, Radio Shack, Blockbuster. I, I still carry my Blockbuster membership card with me in case I like lose my ID. Can't get into a bar, I'll just show them that. All right, there's no way someone under 21 has a Blockbuster membership card. There were some ones I don't even remember. Um, okay, yeah, Circuit City was there. CompUSA, I don't remember CompUSA. Voice stream wireless. I haven't heard of Gateway Computer since like 2002. These are a lot of companies that were really big firms. You know, it takes a lot of money to advertise at a Super Bowl that still in Tom Brady's career has have gone out of business. So we see a lot of churn. And when you see like a lot of churn, you see a lot of these companies go out of business, new ones come in and take their place. The market seems chaotic. And there, there is some truth to that. When Schumpeter called it creative destruction, he wasn't, he wasn't lying. There really is a lot of destruction going on in the economy as we get rid of old products or even the old firms that made those products. But it's worth it in the end because we're provided with much better goods and services because of it. Sometimes you have firms like Sears who are able to reinvent themselves as consumer needs change and technology improves. They were, when they went from um, like mail order catalogs to the big department stores, Unfortunately for them, they weren't able to adjust to the internet and the ability to sell things online. Right. So firms would always prefer to sell goods at a higher price. You see the price of goods being sold right now? Firms would always want to be able to make more money from it. It should be pretty obvious. But what happens is their, their own self-interest, their desire to maximize their profits, forces them to sell at a lower price than what they prefer. Because they need consumers to be willing to buy at that price. If they set the price too high, not too many people are gonna to wanna to actually buy those goods or services. So it's their own self-interest forcing them to offer lower and lower prices that they know people will be willing to buy at. And it's the same, I guess, flipped around for consumers. Obviously, you'd wanna pay as low of a price as possible. You're not going to choose to pay extra in many situations. Maybe if it's like a, a local business from like a family friend or someone who supports your fraternity or your sports teams for your fundraisers, maybe you spend a little bit extra money. But in general, you're not going to want to spend extra money. I don't want to spend extra money when I don't have to. But your self-interest forces you to pay more than that minimum price that you prefer to buy at. You have to buy it at a price that firms are willing to sell at. If it's, 
you know, still something that's going to make you better off. The value is higher than, or the, is less than what you value it at. So this pressure on both consumers and firms forces the market towards equilibrium and this invisible hand that we see. And in real time, firms don't have these supply and demand curves to work with. They don't know what they are. They're not just like out there. Sometimes they can estimate them over time, but that's real difficult to do. Especially trying to understand demand curves because you don't know what consumers' true preferences are until they actually go and you know, do it, until they actually buy the products or don't buy the products. You can do market research and ask people, would you be willing to pay for this? But as they say, talk is cheap. A lot of times people would say, oh yeah, sure, I would do that. And then when it comes to it, not actually go out and pay for it. So it's not like firms just have this to work with and they use that to determine the price. They need the feedback from the market. They need to know, oh, do I have a bunch of extra goods sitting on the shelves? Oh, maybe I should lower the price. Or are they flying off the shelves? Maybe I should increase the price a little bit. But when you watch the process over time, when we later on shift the supply and demand curves and work with it, firms and consumers will act as if they knew this process was going on, even though they don't know. So going back to the example that the text has of the smartwatches, not really sure why they picked smartwatches as the thing to work with for this book. But in this market, working with the supply and demand curves we had in the previous section, the equilibrium of the market is going to be in a price of $350, where those two curves cross. And the quantity is going to be five. There's like five million smartwatches per week. We'll just call five to keep the numbers simple. So there's no reason to expect the price to change right now when this market is in equilibrium. Because at the price of $350, firms want to sell five million and consumers want to buy five million. So there's no incentive for them to change the price, either to raise it or lower it. We've moved towards the end of the market process. The invisible hand has pushed the demand right here to the equilibrium point. Yeah, so this is basically like the end of the analysis. This is what we're moving towards. Um, we typically don't start in equilibrium. Maybe firms happen to guess the perfect price. Oftentimes they guess either too low or too high. And over time, it moves towards equilibrium. So let's look at an example of that. So the price were $400. Equilibrium is still $350, but the price it's being sold at is $400. So consumers at $400 are willing to buy 4 million smartwatches. So where that $400 crosses the demand curve. There. But at this higher price, firms are willing to supply more. Remember, the more you make, the more the price is going to go up. You have to pay workers maybe overtime or hire new workers. You have to pay, you have to buy more of the raw materials. And you have to bid them away from competitors, other firms at a higher price. So they're going to be willing, the price is $400, to sell 6 million smartwatches. So we have 6 million smartwatches being made, put out on the market, and consumer, what the hell is that noise? You guys hearing that? That's weird. All right, whatever. Um, producers want to sell six million. They produced. They're sitting on the shelves. Consumers only want to buy four million. What we end up is <laughs> it's really messing with me. All right. So we have two million smartwatches left over. We have a surplus. <laughs> is it getting worse? Yeah. <laughs> walk somewhere else, is it going to stop? All right, so we have two. <laughs> I don't have a mic on. Is a mic on the desk? I don't know. 
This is weird. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have no idea what's going on. All right. So you have a surplus of two million smartwatches. Surplus is when the quantity supplied is greater than the quantity demanded. You just got a bunch left over. So now if you're a firm and you've got a surplus of these goods sitting on your shelf, what are you, what are you gonna do to try to get them out there, try to get them sold? Lower the price. Lower the price. You know like you're not gonna sell them at this current price, they're just sitting there. So you offer a lower and lower price over time. And as you offer a lower price, one thing you're gonna do is reduce your production for the time being, and you'll draw down on your inventories. It's like a lot of accounting work. It's more, more accounting than, I'm, than I like to do. But you draw down on the inventories you have on hand, and you sell them first, or you make more. So you've got this is the price here. You're gonna slowly decrease the price you're selling at from 400 to 375, 360 to 350. As you keep lowering the price, you'll sell more and more, and consumers are gonna demand more and more. And that'll push you right back down to equilibrium. So funny. Oh, we're looking at a lot of like, oh, yeah, it's hot in here. It is hot as hell in here. Um, you guys messing with the thing, I'm going to be impressed. Oh, no. <laughs> All right. So what happens if there's the opposite problem? The price is $250 instead. When the price is $250, so equal over $350, the price being sold at is $250, firms are only going to be willing to produce a case three million. So right here where that price crosses the supply curve. Again, the more you produce, Firm, the more expensive it's going to be to produce those goods. So you only need to be, off, be able to offer a little bit at that price. But the price is only 250 consumers are going to be willing to purchase a lot more. In this case, they'll be willing to purchase 7 million smartwatches per year. So we now have a shortage in the market. So there's a shortage. In a shortage, the quantity demanded is greater than the quantity supplied. There's not enough to go around. When there's not enough to go around, what's going to happen? Well, in this case, firms realize they can increase the price and not you know, prevent consumers from buying the good, whatever the good is. In this case, smartwatches. So they know. At this price, consumers want to buy 7 million, but as they increase the price, they'll buy less and less. But that's okay because there's a shortage right now. There's not enough to go around. So if those consumers are only willing to pay $250 for a smartwatch, don't buy a smartwatch. That's fine for them because they don't even have that many smartwatches to sell right now. And as they increase that price, as the demand decreases, the supply is going to increase. They'll be able to produce more. Again, because the more you produce, the more expensive it is to produce each good. And that's going to continue from the price of 250 up to 275, 300, 325, all the way up to 350. By the time they hit 350, they're back in equilibrium. The number of small watches consumers are willing to purchase is five. It's five million. And the number of store watches they're willing to sell is five or five million. At that point, there's no incentive for them to change the price again. No incentive to increase it further 
that point we have the opposite problem. We end up with a surplus. And there's no reason to go back and decrease it again, because we'd end up with a shortage again. So in this case, we have firms not knowing the supply and demand curve. They just know that there are extra goods sitting on the shelves or that there's not enough. That pe people are standing in line willing to buy these or they're they're, um, the shelves are like constantly empty. They can see this, they get this feedback and they know, okay, we need to change the price. We need to move it toward either higher price in this case or a lower price when there's a surplus. So that's why we call this the market where you talk about the invisible hand of the market. That not knowing what's going on, they're encouraged to move towards equilibrium as if they know. It's important to note that both demand and supply count when we're trying to work with equilibrium. So price is determined by the interaction of buyers and sellers. So buyers have a role. Something weird about it today? All right. So, in a competitive market, so when there's a lot of buyers and sellers, neither group has power over the others. Consumers don't have power to force producers to sell at a certain price, a lower price than producers would prefer. And producers don't have the power to dictate prices, to charge a higher price, and force consumers to buy it. In a free market, people can just choose not to buy goods that are too expensive. And firms can either deal with selling fewer goods, or they can lower the price to get more people to buy, whatever increases their profit. Um, obviously, in non-competitive markets, that's not exactly the case. So when there's a monopoly, when one firm is the one selling the goods or services. In that case, they do have market power. They have an ability to charge a higher price. It would be the equilibrium price. And again, we'll talk about this much later in the class. Right now, we're focusing on competitive markets. So while consumers and firms don't have sort of market power in these competitive markets to change the price, if we change the supply and demand curves or shift the supply and demand curves, we can affect the price and the quantity traded. And we'll start going over that today. So typically, in real market situations, we know the price and the quantity that goods are being sold at. So typically, we know the price and the quantity in the market. Oh, damn it. <laughs> 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 uh, okay. But when we're working with this model, we need to know the supply and demand curve. So what we're going to do is draw these basic supply and demand curves. Supply and demand curves can come in any shape for a real market. In reality, they can be curves. So instead of a demand curve like this, it could be something more like that in the demand curve. The supply curve, instead of being at like a 45 degree angle, could look like that. When we draw these, we're going to draw them like, like the black lines there, straight lines at a 45 degree angle, because what we're concerned about is the directional changes. We're concerned about if this demand curve shifts from here to here, what's going to happen to price and quantity? Will it increase or decrease? Um, because we don't know the curves, we're not going to be estimating what a shift is going to do to the price. Is it going to move from $3 to $3.12? Something like that. 
we'll just say will the price increase or will the price decrease? Uh, and that's basically all firms can do in the real world, is understand if the price increases, are my sales going to go up or down because of a shift in one of these curves? Okay, I'm not going to play this video today because I'm sure it's going to set that thing off. So we'll, um, I'll play that next class. So what's the effect of an increase in supply on equilibrium? So let's, be sh let's shift the supply curve. So let's say you have the market for smartwatches. And we're stuck with this boring example for the whole chapter. Apple enters the market, they start selling smartwatches. Remember, Apple was really smart for a long time. What they did was instead of being the first one to offer a product, they let someone else offer it, see the mistakes they made, corrected them, improved upon them, and then offered their own, which everyone loved. It's genius if you can do that as a firm. And then get the credit for being visionaries and creating all these new products. So Apple enters the market. When a new firm enters the market that's going to increase the supply, shift it to the right. So we're going to move the supply curve to the right. So from here, S1, over to S2. Now, when you initially, the market is here in equilibrium at T1 and T1. When you shift the supply curve to the right, and from here to here, the new equilibrium point is going to be where the supply curve crosses exactly this new one. What ends up happening is the price decreases and the quantity demanded, or quantity bought and sold in the market, so supply and demand is going to increase here from T1 to T2. Okay, so to draw that out, our supply curve, our demand curve, and our initial equilibrium. Now, I'm not real picky about how you delineate these, like on a test. On our PowerPoint slide here and throughout the textbook, they'll use Q1 and P1 for equilibrium, and then P1 and Q, or PQ and uh, Q2 for the shift afterwards. Or you can do it like this, with a little asterisk next to it. So if you shift the supply curve to the right, And again, the textbook has S1 and S2. I use S and then S with a little um, apostrophe next to it. You can use whatever, just be consistent. Um, and when we shift up, the price is right there and the quantity is right here. We're going to move from this equilibrium point where the original supply curve crosses the demand curve down here to where the new supply curve crosses the demand curve. Again, we're getting a lower price than before and an increase in the quantity. Does this make sense to you guys? All right. So what do you call that point, like that triangle right there? This triangle? Yeah. Or like I remember learning in like microeconomics in high school, like all like each point is like different and like each box is like a point like I don't, I don't know if I'm going crazy right now, but like I think you're thinking of dead weight loss. Okay. That's gonna come in later when we're okay. working with when the market is suboptimal. 